Hi all, welcome. My name is Dorothy Samuels. I'm a member of the Roosevelt the House Advisory Board and my great pleasure tonight is to welcome you here on behalf of Hunter College President Jennifer Rabb and Harold Holzer, the Jonathan F. Banton Director of Roosevelt House. We have a really special program tonight, a necessary and important program, I'd say, in a week that has spotlighted the vital role of a free press and investigative reporting in particular in protecting our constitutional democracy and holding powerful officials accountable. It should not be lost in the rush of events that the appointment of a special counsel, former FBI director Robert Mueller, to lead the investigation into ties between President Trump's campaign and Russian officials directly followed compelling investigative reports in the Washington Post and my former professional home, the New York Times. Tonight's gathering also comes amid non-stop presidential denunciations of the media. Seeking to portray reporters and the news outlets they work for as the enemy of the people. That's a dangerous, dishonest slur with ugly historic connotations and the only positive thing I can think about it or say is it has inspired the excellent title of tonight's program, Not the Enemy of the People. Uh, the focus will be on the future of local investigative reporting, but the discussion of current newsroom pressures and opportunities no doubt will shed a broader First Amendment light. The fact we have such a really good crowd tonight um, owes not just to the subject matter, but to the drawing power of the amazing uh, moderator here tonight, Andrea Bernstein, um, the Peabody award-winning journalist who is senior editor at WNYC, our local uh, public radio station. I should say our, our beloved local public radio station in my family. <laughs> now, during her run at WNYC, she's worn other hats as well, metro editor, political director, senior reporter, and this spring, Andrea has worn another hat, Hunter Colleges uh, at Hunter College, and that is she is the 2017 Jack Newfield Visiting Professor of Journalism right here at Roosevelt House Public Policy Institute, and here she's taught a seminar uh, called Uncovering Power in New York, and I know of no one better to teach that course. She knows a lot about uncovering power in New York, um, and we couldn't have a better panel than the one that she's assembled for us this evening. So Andrea is going to introduce uh, the panelists very shortly, but first, uh, a deeply felt salute, shout out uh, to Jack Newfield's uh, wife of 31 years, his widow, um, a psychotherapist now in the village, long time, the brilliant long time photographer at the Village Voice, this remarkable individual who made the fellowship possible, the Jack Newfield Fellowship possible, and also tonight's program. On behalf of President Rabb and Harold Holzer, I offer all of our thanks um, for your commitment, uh, Janie, to perpetuating the Newfield name and mission by funding the fellowship which was established at Hunter in 2006. It not only acknowledges a truly extraordinary journalist, but it perpetuates Jack's intrepid style of reporting for a new generation of journalism students. Um, previous Newfield Fellows have included the late Wayne Barrett, Charles Stewart, Errol Lewis, Alicia Katz, and Barbara Nevins Taylor, really an amazing, amazing roster. We have been so lucky. Please stand, Janie Eisenberg, so we could acknowledge your vision and your generosity. Thank you all, and 
Andrea, to you. Thank you very much, Dorothy. And I um, just want to say, if you're sitting in the back, there's a few seats here that I think you should just, you know, like at BAM, like they do. <laughs> you haven't, no, if you're not here by curtain time, you can move up and take the seats in the front. Um, so no need to, you don't need to be sitting on the floor. You can come on up and, and sit down on the seats. Um, I just want to add that um, I feel very honored to be teaching a course in the tradition of Jack Newfield, who was a journalist who uh, was not only a fantastic journalist and unearthed so many amazing things and was a gorgeous writer, but who had such a passion about journalism itself and the role of journalism in a democracy. And uh, I started teaching this class. Uh, the first day of this class was, I think it was fe the February 1st. And 11 days before that, Wayne Barrett had died. And I went to his funeral. And many of the people who knew Jack and who knew Wayne were at this event. And uh, it just felt to me like such a, a passing of the torch, like I had to carry it through and I had to give it to some of my students who are here tonight, uh, some of them, uh, hopefully all of them. But <laughs> uh, I know it's the end of the year. So um, just wanted to have that uh, shout out to, to Jack Newfield. <laughs> and we've, we've read a lot of his work and uh, it is gorgeous writing and reporting. So this panel tonight, when I was asked to do this panel, I thought, what should I do this panel on? And it seemed like such a crucial moment uh, in investigative journalism. Uh, I feel like after uh, November 8th, so beginning November 9th, I began to get emails and Facebook posts and other kinds of messages, Andrea, keep investigating. It is never more important. And uh, we have the Washington Post, the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, their subscriptions have all gone up. Uh, ProPublica, which is a nonprofit newsroom, uh, which was one of the partners in Sarah's story that she wrote, uh, they have gotten a big infusion of funds and they're expanding and WNYC is getting a lot of support. So we're at this moment where people are more focused than I can ever remember in my lifetime on the necessity of great journalism and great investigative journalism. And also, we have this moment in history where not only did the president say journalists are the enemy of the people, but he said, we just learned on Tuesday, that he suggested to the FBI director that he should actually start arresting journalists. Uh, who were saying things the president didn't like. And just on my way up here, uh, the, I read about a reporter who was covering the FCC, who was asked questions, and uh, this was not appreciated that he was asked questions. So he was thrown up against the wall by some security guards at the Federal Communications Commissions of all agencies. A woman was arrested for laughing at Jeff Sessions in the House Gallery. This happened. Uh, she faces a year in jail. And another reporter was arrested uh, for asking HHS Secretary Price, not in a press conference, a question. And he was arrested for that. Believe me, I would be in jail for life <laughs> if you only were allowed to ask questions at press conferences. Uh, and then just this evening, I saw on Twitter on my way up here a... Um, a piece of video that was taken by Turkish television of the Turkish president watching as protesters were beat up by his own guards right here in the US of A, right in Washington, DC. They were beat up. It was a very disturbing video. And these are not journalists, but freedom of expression obviously is protected under the same amendment that we are, same amendment, First Amendment. Um, since a campaign rally in October, where the now president said, Second Amendment people, can't you do something about Hillary Clinton? My response has been, First Amendment people, can't you do something about Trump? Uh, so that has been, uh, I think, you know, a mission that I've been on, of sort of digging out the facts, exposing the truth, and we hope galvanizing the populace. I mean, it's a very difficult time, because while we also are getting all of this love, 
we're also getting a tremendous amount of hate uh, and disbelief and death threats, not just from the president, but from people. And it's as if we are coming from an opposing sports team, and because we're wearing the colors of journalism, we're hated before the game is even played. Uh, so that is the moment that we find ourselves in. And I thought that this would be a great moment uh, to convene a panel and have a discussion of uh, two of the finest examples that we have of local investigative reporting and the power of local investigative reporting. And uh, I'll just introduce you. We have Sarah Riley, who just won a Pulitzer Prize. A Pulitzer Prize, everybody. <laughs> like, that's an amazing thing. And, and you know, one of the things that, like, my sources always say to me, if you write this story, you'll win a Pulitzer. <laughs> so, uh, who, for the police, basically evicting people and kicking them out of their apartments, uh, even if they hadn't committed a crime. Uh, and then Sarah Gonzalez, uh, who is my colleague at WNYC, I should say that uh, Sarah Riley's work was done for ProPublica and the Daily News, was a partnership, and she now works at a an online journalist out, outlet called The Trace, which covers gun, gun violence, gun violence. Uh, and Sarah Gonzalez is my colleague at WNYC, and she has won the Daniel Shore Prize for the best young public radio journalist in the country, in the country, and <laughs> we, we just learned last night Sarah's a finalist for the Livingston Prize, which is a extremely prestigious prize for young journalists. And then we also have joining us, and I am really pleased to say, uh, Paul Moses, who's a professor at Brooklyn College and an author, and wrote a very thought-provoking series for the Daily Beast about local journalism and wither local journalism and what it means for democracy. So thank you, everybody, for coming. And I thought that this would be a great way to sort of embrace the contradictions of the moment and talk them through. So I thought we would start with the Sarahs talking about their work. Uh, and then, to bring us down, Paul Moses will put it all in context <laughs> uh, to show us uh, the, the, both the pitfalls and the opportunities of the current moment. So we'll start with Sarah Riley. And uh, if you just want to you know, tell us how you, um, what kind of reporting you've been doing and how you got to do this story which showed the injustice of people, completely innocent people, not convicted of any crime, being thrown out onto the streets uh, because they were suspected of having done something wrong. Well, uh, thank you uh, so much for that kind introduction and also for having me on this panel. It's really an honor to uh, be here with uh, three really great journalists, so I uh, really appreciate it. Um, so, uh, I, 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 as uh, Andrea said, I now work at The Trace, which is a nonprofit that focuses on gun violence in America. But for five years, I was at the New York Daily News, both as an editor and as an investigative journalist. And uh, most of my work at The Daily News focused on the NYPD, broken windows policing, uh, the intersection of civil and, uh, and criminal law. And so I did an, a number of investigations in, in that vein and, um, and had a lot of impact and you know just speaking in terms of the the power of uh, local uh, journalism it was just really an uh, incredible experience working at the New York Daily News and just seeing how much um, influence a uh, local uh, newspaper has in the community that it covers and uh, and just the uh, sort of irreplaceable uh, uh, voice that uh, is the New York Daily News especially for everyday uh, New Yorkers, it has that niche. And, um, you know, my, I, I'm proud to say that, you know, my investigations had a tremendous amount of impact in passing legislation. Um, but just, you know, day in and, and day out, the work that the reporters there do, both the, you know, daily reporters and investigative reporters do have a lot of impact. And so I, I think that um, uh, it's really important to note that. Um, so uh, to uh, talk a little bit about my investigation, I did prepare some points to prevent myself from uh, rambling because I did work on this for three years, so wow. <laughs> that, that's, a, that's a challenge. <laughs> when you, my, I think I have like eight gigabytes of notes on my computer <laughs> for, this, for this series. Uh, so anyway, um, I'm just gonna kind of try and reference this a little bit. But um, 
Uh, I uh, came across uh, the story in uh, 2014 while working on another project actually with a group of reporters on uh, police misconduct lawsuits. Just going through the stack of uh, lawsuits, uh, I came across one that mentioned that the city had tried to evict the, the plaintiff, a woman, from her home, uh, even though uh, the criminal charges that were filed against her as a result of a drug raid had been uh, long ago dismissed. And so I, that was just a few words in this you know, lengthy lawsuit about this unlawful arrest, uh, but I was really interested. I didn't know that such a mechanism existed. So um, I started uh, digging into that, and I, and I found out that the type of cases that uh, or th these types of cases are called uh, nuisance abatement actions. Um, these are uh, civil lawsuits that the uh, city files against businesses and homes that it says are being used for illegal activity. Um, it's, uh, the legal concepts are similar to civil forfeiture, uh, but rather than seeking to seize property, the city is just seeking to close it down for a year. So it's mainly targeted at, at renters, although it can be targeted at owners. But um, uh, uh, it, it, it rather, a lot of people confuse it with civil forfeiture, but it's, it's a little bit different, but sort of same type of concepts. Um, the law was enacted in the 1970s uh, to root out the sex industry in Times Square. Um, the, uh, the concept is uh, targeting a location uh, rather than the, the, you know, the people that are breaking the law. So um, it, with the example of a brothel, uh, the police would make arrest of the, uh, the prostitutes or the Johns, and uh, that would really not make a dent in the criminal enterprise of the actual brothel. They would be released, or new women would you know, come and take their place, and the brothel would continue to operate. So with this law, they were able to file a lawsuit against the actual lo location to shut down the location, rather than sort of dealing with the revolving door of the criminal justice system. Um, so uh, that, uh, uh, because it's a civil lawsuit, I think it's important to notice, um, or note rather, um, there's a much lower standard of proof. So uh, the cases are based on a certain number of incidents at a location. They do not have to include arrests. They could include just allegations made by uh, a confidential informant. Um, and we came across uh, dozens of cases like this uh, when, when we looked at them where it was just uh, you know, two, three instances where a confidential informant had said they bought drugs at a location, no arrest, but the city uh, still filed these uh, nuisance abatement actions. Um, and uh, I think it's just worth punctuating this point that this is, these are families that are getting thrown out of their apartments because somebody said something might be going on, and that it's routine, and also what it was quadrupled since the Time it started. Yes, or? yes, I was yes, and I was I was getting to that. So, in the in the uh, in the 1990s, uh, the NYPD was given permission to initiate their own cases. At that time, they only did it maybe you know 200 times a year, and uh, primarily against criminal enterprises like you know bodegas uh, that were really fronts for drug operations. That was sort of more what the law was intended for. They were not used against homes. So fast forward to. Uh, you know, when we were looking at this 2013, 2014, uh, the, it, the number had gone up to roughly 1,000 cases a year, and um, roughly half of those cases were actually filed against homes, and then the other half filed against businesses. I think it's important not to forget the businesses because, um, you know, for, for the businesses, the number one type of offense was underage alcohol sales, but these weren't like the unruly clubs that the NYPD usually cites when they talk about why they need this law. They were, um, you know, I, I canvassed entire neighborhoods, you know, going location to location, and it was all, you know, immigrant-owned bodegas that were accused of uh, selling alcohol to minors um, once, twice, maybe three times. And so, you know, these people also faced losing their life savings and their livelihoods, um, and, and so that's, that's also a significant uh, harm, too. So you had, you know, both the families and the, uh, and, and the businesses, and, and by and large, they were, you know, small business owners, and a lot of the offenses that they were being accused of were, were actually pretty minor. It wasn't, you know, prostitution, you know, drug enterprise, and whatnot. Um, so uh, uh, one sort of ele unique element of this law, um, the NYPD is able to, in a secret hearing, they initiate their case in a secret hearing where they uh, request from a judge a closing order that will allow them to surprise the tenants, the family, or the... Uh, or the business owner with an order closing down the location immediately, uh, pending the outcome of the case. Uh, so, 
then the tenants or the uh, business uh, owner are forced to negotiate under the duress of either being unable to earn a living or being completely homeless. And so that uh, gives them, obviously, an enormous amount of leverage during settlement negotiations. Um, most of the residential tenants did not have an attorney in civil court. You're not entitled to an attorney, so they're you know, at a significant disadvantage. A lot of the um, residential tenants who I interviewed um, uh, were actually confused and thought that the NYPD's attorney was there to give them advice. Some of them mistakenly called the NYPD's attorney their court-appointed attorney. Um, you know, the, these a lot of times these you know people are you know poor and and uh, not uh, you know exactly savvy. Although it is a very complex area of law, but um, some people even thought that it was part of the criminal proceeding and sort of conflated it with the with the criminal proceeding as well. One woman thought she would go to jail if she didn't sign the settlement that the NYPD was asking her to sign. Um, and so to settle the cases uh, for the residential tenants, um, a lot of them ended up uh, agreeing to bar certain family members from their homes for life um, or you know, for three years a year, but sometimes even for life. Um, one of the women uh, that we featured in the story uh, the NYPD had uh, claimed that they found 45 cups of cocaine during a drug raid on her home. Uh, those ca charges were quickly dismissed. Uh, it turned out that it was uh, a lab test that showed the powder was negative for narcotics, and uh, it was uh, crushed eggshells that she used in a spiritual ritual. Um, but then four months later, the NYPD filed um, a nuisance abatement action against the home, citing the 45 cups of cocaine as if the lab test had never came back negative. Um, and we found that this happened a lot. Charges filed, at, or these cases filed long after the charges had been dismissed. Um, and, uh, you know, so her and her, you know, baby and her uh, two school-age kids and her other two uh, sons, older sons, that, you know, she was all kind of raising them in the same house, they were all instantly made homeless for several days until they could come, she could come to court to negotiate a settlement. And in order to get the closing order lifted, she agreed to borrow her son Akeen home, from her home for life. Um, again, you know, based on those charges that were dismissed. And at that point, he had a, actually a clean record. He had some minor, you know, possession type charges that were dismissed, um, but nothing, you know, major. So actually, technically today, even though that case was from 2011, he's still not allowed to even set foot inside of her building as a result of these this order. So. You know, this is sort of a, these are civil lawsuits um, that are t that target a, a location and uh, act as, in a sense, collective punishment on the entire families of people that are accused of committing crimes. Um, so, uh, in terms of uh, how the reporting was done, um, you know, I, I, like I said, I spent you know three years on this. Um, sometimes, how is it the Daily News let you spend three years oh. on a story? <laughs> well. A lot of it, I, I was juggling um, a lot of other things for, I think, like the first uh, two years. Um, I was an editor, an investigative reporter, doing, you know, data, and so it's sort of typical, you know, stretch-thin newspaper. I'm sure Paul will talk about more. Um, and so I was just kind of like chipping away, but there are other kind of more immediate things, like, uh, uh, you know, I had some summons data. I ended up doing this big summons series that also resulted in... in changes in laws, actually, but that was sort of more timely because of the Eric Garner death. So one example of putting that to the side to do the summon series, which I, which I don't regret, um, that, uh, you know, there's a lot of, it totally impacted the conversation about broken windows policing. But um, so then we ended up partnering with um, ProPublica, uh, which was really key. I think that's kind of the future here with investigative journalism is partnerships. And they um, helped by providing researchers so that we could go in and, um, enter dozens of details on 1,162 nuisance abatement cases filed over an 18-month period. Um, so we went in and we entered all those details into a spreadsheet so that I could analyze it. And uh, the reason why, uh, you know, I wanted to show that these, you know, specific cases that we were finding and, and using to sort of illustrate the issue weren't anomalies, but they were actually systemic. Um, and we were able to do that because of the, you know, weeks that we spent entering details from 1,162 cases into a spreadsheet so I could sort of quantify like every step of the process. Um, and uh, you know, I could say things like nine out of 10 of the actions were filed against locations that were located in black or Hispanic communities. 
Um, I could, you know, say what percentage were filed over drugs, underage alcohol sales, what percentage of people agreed to warrantless searches in order to get back into their homes or their businesses, um, or cameras and card readers, and and so that that was very powerful. Um, and uh, and so uh, just kind of to wrap it up and talk about like the you know how these types of uh, stories have impact. Um, so that series. Uh, uh, prompted the city council to introduce and, and, and enact actually uh, 13 bills that uh, made sweeping reforms to the nuisance abatement law. Um, the first reforms actually to add protections for the accused rather than expanding the NYPD's enforcement powers um, in the, you know, since the 70s when the law was enacted. Um, and uh, three of the plaintiffs are, um, or three of the people that we featured in this series are lead plaintiffs in a class action lawsuit that has, that seeks to have other components declared unconstitutional. The NYPD and the law department did the top to bottom review of their practices. Um, the city, uh, one of the top judges, you know, uh, put out a um, advisory urging judges to change their practices. So it had a lot of impact. But um, in uh, uh, you know the conversations with officials and and going to the hearings and stuff, um, you know, the the data analysis was was certainly uh, you know frequently cited. The the statistics that we had, which took a lot of time and effort to get to because we had to manually create the database. Um, also, the examples from the field reporting, the, even the fact that these people had allowed their photographs to be taken. Um, and so, you know, that that work took a tremendous amount of time. Um, but, you know, I think that because it was sort of a whole package that combined both data analysis with, you know, human narrative and legal analysis um, that, that, that sort of made the conclusions undeniable in a sense and the NYPD didn't really have any way to sort of deny my findings because I sort of cover all my bases. Um, I got the sense that the yeah. NYPD uh, was doing this because they could and because no one called them on it. Right. And that their response to your reporting that you had in the story seemed to be like, yeah, well, we do this because we can do this, which, um, I mean, to me, is a shining example of why this kind of, th if no one had come and shown the spotlight on it, they would be doing it today because they're cops and because they have that recourse. So, and uh, I think we're gonna talk a little bit more about that with Sarah's reporting. I just wanted to interject, do people here know what ProPublica is? If you know what ProPublica is, raise your hand. So like m m half of you. So ProPublica is a non-profit newsroom that they are terrific. They are, they were started about, I would say, almost 10 years ago now. Um, and they're, um, they are publicly supported and donor supported. And they work with a lot of newsrooms. They work with the Daily News, they work with us a lot. And uh, they provide support and they co-investigate stories and they do their own investigations. And I'll just sort of put a little asterisk there because I think we'll sort of talk about that a little bit more about the future of investigative journalism. But I wanted to go now to Sarah Gonzalez, um, whose story, now that I am hearing Sarah Riley's story, has a lot of parallels. So if you want to also talk about your award-winning story and, and how you did it. About doing things because you can do them? Yeah. Um, even though there might not necessarily be, right? Okay. Um, so I did a series called Kids in Prison, and it was a six-part series, and each part dealt with something, some different aspects of minors in adult prisons. Uh, the first story was on racial disparities. Um, the second story was on like the experience, what it's like to be a minor in an adult prison. The third story was on uh, sentencing laws in New Jersey versus New York versus other places, because New Jersey has unusually uh, harsh sentencing laws for minors who are tried as adults. The fifth story was on corrections officers, um, how they're trained to interact with young people in adult prisons uh, here in the US compared to other places. And then the sixth story was on like once you're out of adult prison uh, having gone in as a minor. I had come across, I, I started this series thinking it was gonna be one story. Um, I had just finished a series on foster care and on who, which moms lose custody of their children. And people in, and it was like 90% black mothers lose custody of their children for crimes or for doing things that um, white mothers also do but do not lose custody of their children over. Um, and in that world, uh, people had been telling me that 
um, prosecutors in New Jersey were trying black and Latino kids as adults, and that they were not trying white kids as adults, white kids who were committing the same kinds of crimes as, as black and Latino kids. And so I thought I would get the data, poke around, test whether or not that was true, and, and, and go from there. Um, I went to the state, and the state said, oh no, we don't keep any data on which minors get tried as adults. Um, and by tried as adults, I mean like they're not in the juvenile justice system. They go to an adult court where like you see their picture in the news and you know their name and they'll get a permanent record and they go to an adult prison. And they're like middle school kids. Right, like as young as 14 was the youngest. Um, and they said, oh, we don't keep any data on that. You have to go to the counties. So I went to all of the counties in New Jersey. Or I started out with a few of the counties in New Jersey, and they said, and I said, hey, I want to know like how many times your prosecutor in your county asked to try a minor as an adult, and how many times that request was approved by a judge. They said, oh no, we don't we don't keep that data. You have to go to the administrative office of the courts at the state level. They'll keep that data. I go to the administrative office of the courts, and they're like, no, we don't keep that. We have we have no reason why we would want to keep that. So I go back to the state department of corrections, and I'm like, are you guys all telling me that nobody knows how many minors in your state have been prosecuted as adults? Nobody knows that and the State Department of Corrections, they said, well, we do know how many minors are currently in our prison today. We can't tell you how many were there all this year, but we can tell you, like, we could look at our system and say, today there are, you know, five minors in, a, in our prisons in the state, um, which is clearly not enough. Um, this is months of being told, like, no, 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 no. Um, and I knew, like, there, there has to be They always tell you the way. data doesn't exist. Yeah, they always tell you that. Um, so then I find a report from 2004, and it was looking at, it was like about like how much resources to put into each court, like how many judges do we need based on the caseload that this one county gets in these in criminal proceedings. Um, and in that report, I found like the juveniles who are tried as adults, and it was from the, state, the administrative office of the court. So I went back to them and I said, hey, in 2004 you kept this data because look, here's the report. So does that mean you no longer keep the data? And if so, why do you no longer keep the data? And then maybe two, three weeks later they were like, oh, we found the data. Here's the data. Um, and at this point I was like already pursuing other stories that were not the racial disparities. I was like looking at the longer sentences and, and uh, the experiences of being a minor in an adult prison. Um, so it came in kind of late. And we looked at the data and found that 88% um, of minors tried as adults were black or Latino. And 88% of those approved, like who were going to be transferred into the adult criminal justice system were black or Latino. So basically, if you're black or Latino and you went before uh, a judge, the judge was going to try you as an adult. Um, then we looked at, um, so, so okay, so 90% of minors who are currently in adult prisons in New Jersey are black or Latino. Um, I wanted to uh, look at what does that mean for them. And uh, in New Jersey, you're in the country, you are not a mine, you're not an adult until you turn 18, right? In the country, except in New York and North Carolina. New York is changing that. Um, but in New York and, New and North Carolina, you can be 16 years old and tried as an adult and everything, all of your experiences are as an adult once you go into the criminal justice system. But in every single state in the country, you can be considered an adult if you committed a certain kind of crime that are considered adult crimes. Usually they're violent crimes. But like going up to someone and saying, give me your car keys is considered an adult crime, right? Carjacking is an adult crime. Um, so one of the kids in my story, he got nine years in an adult prison for um, going up to someone, taking their cell phone and their car keys. He didn't actually, and their wallet. He didn't actually get in the car and steal the car. He just wanted the money and the cell phone. Uh, but because he had the car keys, he got carjacking uh, on his record. And so to give you an example of, of the differences in the sentencing laws, a 14-year-old who commits a robbery in New York, uh, tried as an adult, could get one year in prison. Um, that's the lowest, that's the absolute lowest that they have to do is one year 
In New Jersey, the absolute lowest that that same 14-year-old has to do is eight and a half years for the exact same crime. A 14-year-old who commits a murder in New York has to do at the very, very least five years in prison. In New Jersey, a 14-year-old who commits a murder has to do at the very, very least 25 and a half years in prison. So it's like a pretty big difference, right? Five years versus 25 and a half years. Um, part of the story then became like, well, how often is New York actually giving 14 and 15 year olds five years in prison, um, which is a whole other story. Um, but the point is, is that um, there is at least a recognition of youth in New York when it comes to sentencing laws that does not exist in New Jersey. I wanted to find a system, a place, a city, a county that doesn't do this. Um, there are a couple counties that have little programs, but basically every state in the country allows minors to be prosecuted as adults. There is no place that I could go to um, to be like, look, New Jersey, you don't have to do it this way. Like, that doesn't exist. So we got a grant from uh, Solutions Journalism Network, um, and they were like, well, go to the place that does do things differently and show us what that's like. So I went to Germany. Um, I went to Germany. German prisons, yeah, Germany of all places. I could have gone to like Scandinavian, but... Germany, the new beacon of the free world. <laughs> Apparently. Um, the, uh, but I figured Germany would be a good place because it's big. Uh, you know, they have a very big economy and like if the United States was maybe going to try to replicate another system, Norway would probably not be the place to go to, but like maybe Germany. So I visited German prisons uh, in Germany. You are a minor, uh, you're considered a minor until you're 24. So 24 and under you're a minor because Science says that that is when the adolescent brain stops becoming, stops being an adolescent brain. It's not like on your 14th birthday, you know, it's, you know, it could be 23, it could be 22, um, but 24 is like the general consensus of when your brain changes. And there's like studies that you can like see a brain and be like, this is a 14 year old brain, and it looks exactly the same as a 22 year old's brain, and then over time it, it starts to, to look more like an adult brain. Um, in Germany, minors cannot get more than 10 years, regardless of the crime that they commit. Um, in the United States, minors can spend the rest of their lives in prison. Uh, the United States Supreme Court had recently ruled that minors cannot get life sentences without the possibility of getting out on parole. Um, they said that kids need hope for some years of life outside of prison walls. That was um, in their uh, statement. Um, but there's kind of like a loophole, right? Because you don't have to, if you get 60 years in prison um, and you're 17 years old, like that is your life in prison, right? But because it doesn't say life, um, it's not considered life. So I found kids who were sentenced to 50, 60, and 100 years, and 120 years, and it wasn't considered life without the possibility of parole because technically in 100 years they could apply for parole even though it was after their natural lifespan. Since the series aired, and probably more because of advocates than, than my stories, um, the, United, the New Jersey Supreme Court has ruled that those kids who have 100 years and six, 75 years will have to be resentenced. Um, but you know, they will still, there will be many kids who will still die in prison. Um, and that is not an option in, in Germany. Um, yeah, uh, I'll tell you some stuff about German prisons just because I thought it was interesting. Um, in Germany, minors like have to have a job, right? Uh, or once they're out of high school, they have to have a job, nine to five. They get paid minimum wage, whatever minimum wage is on the outside, they get paid that on the inside. Um, like 30% of their earnings goes into a savings account so that when they get out, they have all this money that they can um, do something with. Before they get out, they all get, um, the ones that don't have a place to live, they go apartment shopping with like the prison director or the warden, they take them out and they go like, actually like, oh no, this apartment I don't like, like maybe this one. Um, male and female inmates are in prison together. They don't sleep in the same rooms. There's like a floor that separates the women's floor versus the men's floor, but they go to school together, they work together, um, they hold hands, they kiss, they make out. Uh, apparently they can do anything that they want except have sex because they don't want prison babies. Um, the whole point of prison in Germany is to mirror the outside world. It's supposed to be like, you can do everything 
here in prison that you can do on the outside except like have a cell phone or go on the internet and that's basically it. Um, and the point is to teach people how to live a life without crime so that when they get out they know how to live a life without crime. Whereas in the United States, the uh, mission of the prison system is, is to punish. The mission of the juvenile justice system is to rehabilitate, um, but those kids are not going there. They're in the adult system. So thank you, both Sarahs. <laughs> um, so Paul Moses wrote a series of articles for the Daily Beast uh, earlier this month? Early, well, last month, I guess. Yeah. Last month. Um, very, you know, sort of uh, caused a ripple of alarm among journalists. The lead of his story was how in Queens, which is huge population... 2.3 Two, uh, million, Okay, so that's like bigger than, you know, Philadelphia and Boston and San Francisco and, you know, most cities in the country. Um, in the court system, there are no reporters. Uh, so um, I'm going to let you... Let's just, you can just explain what your story was about, and then maybe we'll have a sort of a little discussion about how to kind of reconcile the contradiction of great reporting is happening, and it's impossible for great reporting to happen. Yeah, uh, so I actually started the piece in a, in, a, in a place I used to cover as a reporter at uh, New York Newsday years ago, the Queen's Courthouse, and um, the, the press room is, is just locked there now. Um, once in a while, there's a big story that draws uh, everybody in, and then they open it up. Um, but, you know, there's no reporter regularly roaming the courts of, uh, you know, the county. I think it's the 11th largest county in the country in terms of population. Enormous number of cases tried there. And, and it's symptomatic of kind of a shrinkage that's going on. I, I, I liken it to kind of climate change. Um, you know, the, the New York media has kind of shrunk from covering Long Island and New Jersey. And now it's shrinking from covering Queens. Uh, and I mean, there are daily, weekly there, but they don't provide that the irreplaceable voice that that, that you term you use, Sarah, just caught my ear. The Daily News, right? The Daily News is totally withdrawn, uh, and reporters who once were badgering the borough president and you know going to meetings and you know doing all it's just not it's just not there anymore. Um, so that that was a big concern for me and. I wouldn't say investigative reporting, but I would describe it under the heading of accountability journalism still. Um, and, you know, I was thinking, I couldn't fit this in the story, but when I was a reporter in Queens, sometimes you did find stories just by kind of going around the I courthouse. I, I, one example that stuck in my mind, there was a trial of a woman who was charged with murdering her young child. And I just kind of wandered into it one day, and I found out from somebody this woman had lost five previous children, all supposedly to crib death. And the people who were, you know, watching this case were like, they were people who were very upset. And somehow I, I, went, I was able to get the, the whole uh, uh, city caseworker file for, for this case, you know, going back to the beginning. And just pieced together the full story of, first of all, they, they totally mishandled the case for which the woman was actually convicted. But the whole story was just... But it's just, you know, it's not a huge story, but it was a story to tell and uh, let people know what's going on. And, you know, that will never, nobody would ever find that unless they were assigned to that beat. So, so I'm very concerned with, um, with that kind of shrinkage um, in the ecosystem. But, you know, there, there are some good things happening. Uh, does the news still have an investigative team, would you say? Or is it kind of like Greg Smith writing a lot of stories? Uh, <laughs> Greg's a friend of mine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, I know that they just hired an enterprise editor. They're doing it and, more. That's good. And they have a um, an enterprise uh, yeah. a reporter, James Finelli, who's at DNA Info. Yeah, um, I saw they just I just saw his byline like today, right? Yeah. yeah. And then I, I think that the reporters try and do juggle some investigative and uh, sort of quick turnaround investigative yeah. stories with their with their beats. Um, a lot of team uh, projects. A lot of teams work on stories. At one together. time, it was a fairly large team, probably about six. Six well, they don't have a they yeah. don't have a de designated I team anymore. But I just right. mean that you know you have reporters who are like in the shack and and runners and uh, yes, yeah. you know Greg and you know or someone in City Hall like all just sort of like in sort of a madcap way like throwing in like whatever they can to sort of you know do investigative stuff like you know uh, example a recent example um, some of the the deaths that uh, of children that were t supposed to be under ACS's care. 
um, the Daily News has been hitting ACS really hard. On, They've done well with that, yes. Right, uh, yeah. but, but that type of work, um, I think investigative reporting gets a lot of attention, but a lot of the, the daily reporting doesn't get as much attention. But those stories all sort of arose out of like daily reporting, uh, you know, police reporters, uh, runners, like running out to the scene, and there was a, a, a number of just sort of um, exclusives or scoops or, if you will, of oversight by ACS. That the that the Daily News got just kind of hammering away at it with yep. teams of daily reporters that had a huge impact, resulted in investigations and stuff like that. And I, I feel like that type of reporting is overlooked in terms of impact journalism. But yeah. like, it's really key. Yeah. Sorry to go into no, change. no, thank you. Um, the I guess the the other kind of big picture observation that I wrote about was that the problem with local journalism is that if you're writing a story just for even a city as big as New York, it doesn't have the same potential online audience as a story that has a national or an international audience. So there's really, even within newsrooms that are local news organizations, there's a shift towards aggregating um, national news. Depends on the organization. The Times may be doing more serious kind of stuff. Another publication may be doing gossip, um, but it, in, in any case, it, it shifts resources away from the local reporting because they, they need to generate web traffic. And if you, one way to do that is to be in on a trending national or international story. So that, that's a, what I found to be a, a pretty big uh, factor, uh, too, in, in, the, in this picture. Well, the other thing that was starting is the way you quantified what's happened with the New York Times. What is it, half now? Half the reporters covering Metro? The, the Times uh, has cut back its, its local news coverage a lot over the years uh, and even has a, try to make it seem like it's for the better, uh, which irks a lot of people, uh, including within the Times. But um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, I interview uh, Wendell Jamison, the Metro editor, and Wendell's doing, I think, the best with a, with a difficult situation there. Um, but you know, when he came in there around 2000 or so, there were maybe 85 Metro desk reporters, and now they have maybe about 42 or something. So, so something's got to give. They also have very little space uh, for their Metro stories. They do, you know, about six stories a day. This is New York City. You know, six stories a day. There's Does anybody remember the Metro section, B1? Right. At the end of, um, I don't remember the year of its demise, but I remember that at the annual reporter's Christmas party, Mayor Bloomberg used to give gag gifts, and he gave a jar of B1 vitamins to the New York Times reporter, saying, this is the last time you'll see B1, because you know, didn't, the section didn't really exist anymore. Um, he also gave us 18 cassette tapes for uh, our series on uh, in-rem housing, which we never did. Uh, but for our 18-part series, so we still have the box plus a jar of aspirin. Uh, but I'm wondering, Paul, because obviously there's sort of there's great things happening in local mm -hmm. investigative journalism, like really, you know. And yeah. here are two big examples of it right here. So I'm wondering, sort of, you know, what you how you sort of reconcile the fact that uh, the, it's structurally so difficult, and yet, you know, the heart well, is still beating. Well, it's, it is interesting because what I drew from both your really good presentations was, and I hope you, you, I'm sure you saw this too, the time and the persistence that it takes, right? That was so implicit in what, what both of you said. And that really goes kind of against the grain of a lot that's going, sweeping through journalism right now. Time, <laughs> nobody's got time for anything, right? But you do. Uh, and persistence too. Um, it's so easy to, I think, for public relations people to put a lot of reporters off because they're so busy and, and you know, you just kept coming back at them. I mean, that, that's really what it, what you got to do. But but it's it's hard for a lot of reporters to do that. But why is it um, working? I think part of it is that people who are interested in the subject uh, of, uh, are trying to preserve it, and so ProPublica uh, is one thing. What you're doing at WMYC has, get get support because people feel it, it's valuable, um, and you know some of those things are 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 working. Um, I, what bothers me, though, is that the newspapers like the news are still a very good vehicle for getting the word out, for having impact. You, you saw that when you wrote for the news. And um, 
um, I'm just worried about those local papers uh, one surviving. Interesting, one interesting thing that's happened now is the Daily News has just started to take our investigations and it publishes them. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it published a story that one of my colleagues did about a, um, a pseudo lawyer that was representing people in immigration court, uh, but um, was actually a criminal himself and was basically scamming people, telling them that he was selling them cards that if ICE came to arrest them, if they gave him this card, they would be fine, which was not true, obviously. Uh, and uh, they published a story that I did about Paul Manafort with a colleague on uh, his real estate deals in New York. And, you know, it's kind of cool for it to be in the Daily News because they had all of their, like, crazy tabloid graphics and headlines and, like, you know, red circles around, like, you know, so it was nice. Uh, and also, Robert Lewis, a, a colleague of ours who covers a lot of police abuse issues, had a story in the Daily News, and uh, the police commissioner, Daily o uh, Jimmy O'Neill, um, talked about the story in the press conference, and he was like, well, I saw the story in the paper, and it was like, it was on the radio first. Uh, but, I mean, I think it's true. That is really true about the Daily News. I mean, it has such a vast audience. So, sort of, you know, the Daily News has fired a lot of its reporters in waves now. So it's kind of a mixed thing, you know, to, like, have my story just be, like, picked up by the Daily News. It's like we're a nonprofit newsroom, so it's fine. It's not about, like, taking our work. But it's like that's great, but it's also kind of heartbreaking because it's like they don't have their own reporters doing that work. We're going to take questions in, in, they credit us, yes. Yeah. We're going to take questions in like just one minute. Um, so I just want to have a quick answer from the Sarahs on whether you feel in your work like um, the pressure of less news coverage or whether it's been sort of an opportunity for you. So do you feel the, the situation that Paul is describing where, you know, newspapers are developing, you know, are dedicating fewer resources and editors are like, we want more quick things that people can click on, and does that? Yeah, yeah. so I, I think that my instance was, um, you know, somewhat of a unique uh, case. Uh, there weren't really any other reporters at the Daily News that were given the amount of time, you know, for stories that I was, but I sort of worked my way up to that point. But, um, I, you know, I think that, the main problem, just sort of going off of what you guys were saying, is uh, that you know while uh, nonprofit outlets like WMYC and ProPublica um, have you know been benef benefiting hugely, hugely <laughs> from the the Trump administration, and then even like the Times and the Washington Post with the online subscribers, uh, local uh, news outlets like the Daily News, they don't have a subscription website, um, so they're not poised to benefit in that way, and they don't have a a uh, nonprofit sort of set up where they can take donations towards investigative reporting. I think that that is, or, and even local reporting, accountability reporting, I think that that's the case with a lot of newspapers across the country where they just don't really have this set up other than if you're going to buy a print subscription, which I think a lot of people, you know, don't want anymore um, to, to, you know, take in this influx of cash. And so actually I could say, though, that the Daily News is looking, exploring some type of model like that so that they can find other sources of funding um, besides just advertiser dollars and, and subscribers um, in order to be able to hire more reporters. And I think that that's really what news, um, local news outlets are realizing that they have to do at this point. I think, you know, in Philadelphia, you have like the um, Len, Len the, you know, the foundation that owns the, the Philadelphia paper, um, it's sort of a nonprofit, for-profit um, uh, hybrid, um, you know, LenFest. Foundation. They, they, they're uh, potentially they've raised 50 million. They might raise 100 million dollars this year to benefit local journalism. I mean, I think that we're just going to have to see, you know, more, more, you know, models like that. I mean, but, but part of the reason why I left was because I was, you know, afraid for the, you know, longevity of my job. I mean, to be honest, because there were, you know, I, I, I was there for five years. There were several rounds of layoffs while I was there. All the desks around me were empty. Um, they used to be full, um, you know. So in that sense, I did feel the, the pressure. Sarah, did you want to address this? And then we'll take questions from the audience. Is there a, a handheld mic? Yes, okay. So raise your hand if you want to ask a question, and I will call on you. But 
quickly from Clara. Um, I think, I don't know that I necessarily fear, feel pressure to produce more investigative stuff. I know that it's like definitely a big priority in our newsroom. Um, I feel like there are a lot of stories that I personally want to tell, and then there's a lot of stories that my editor wants me to tell, and then there's a lot of stories that my editor's boss wants her to tell me to tell. Um, and so there's like, uh, there's that pressure for sure. Um, and then I think after the election, I was in this place where, and it was after the election and then also um, after coming off of like a series of stories that just like made me really depressed about like all of our justice systems <laughs> and like social safety networks um, that made me say like, I wanna just like tell a couple of stories here and there about like positive things that are happening in this community. Um, I was hearing from our listeners. I, I host one of our, our guest hosts, one of our um, news shows where listeners call in and they were regularly telling us like, can you just say something positive? Like, I can't even listen to the news anymore. I would go out um, and people that I would interview would be like, oh, I'm sorry. Like, I just turn off the radio every time I hear Trump now because I can't. And I'm like, so when do you listen? And they're like, yeah, no, basically I never turn on the radio anymore. Like, I turn it off constantly and then I turn it on and I hear Trump and I turn it off. And I was getting this a lot. And so I am like in this place where I want to tell um, like positive stories. Uh, and I think there's some push back on that because there's so many problems that need to be reported on um, because there's no one else, not no one else doing it, but there's s less journalists uh, now who are doing it, that there's just like this sea of like problems that you have to report on. Um, and so I'm kind of, I guess, yeah, there. <laughs> so support local journalism. WNYC is having its pledge drive now. So if you are not a member, sign up. And if you are, give more. Uh, and subscribe to newspapers because it's really important. And buy the daily news. And um, we're going to take some questions. So this gentleman over here. My name is. My name is Chandrakant Pancholi and from Overseas India Weekly, I have a two-part question. One is why all of you are doing or did stories on criminal justice system where there are hindrances to go after politicians or political, politically powerful people. And secondly, the sources of funding, right? Because investigative journalism will require a lot of funding at second tier and third tier level people so, or newspapers because Washington Post or NPR or Daily News or New York Post can always do it but there may be hundreds of new small newspapers all over the United States. Okay, so that's three questions <laughs> and a lot of people want to have them so I think let's take the issue of criminal justice. Why did you both choose criminal justice. It's just the happenstance that I asked them both, and that's what they both did. Uh, well, I started out at the Daily News as the courts editor. Uh, so, uh, you know, I had seven reporters who were uh, covering the courthouses. And then uh, from there, I sort of transitioned into like a projects editor and to doing data analysis and stuff like that with the reporters that I was uh, managing. I also worked a lot with the police uh, bureau. Uh, so it just actually sort of transitioned from that. Prior to uh, covering criminal justice, I spent four years covering real estate and development, and then I did GA on a, a national level, covering everything from like tax shelters to homeland security. But it was it actually just really sort of evolved from uh, being the courts editor for me personally. But I, I think it's a, obviously a ripe. Uh, I think you it's know, an area where there's a lot of abuse. Yeah, exactly. So. I should say though that Andrea is our like political investigative. Person. Um, I've done a lot of political investigations, yeah. it's true, and still am. Yes. <laughs> so, uh, yes, this gentleman in the red shirt. Hi, um, thanks for your presentations. You've, you've all talked about sort of the impunity with which, you know, the NYPD or actually the court system function given legislation from the state and others. and. And what I'm wondering about is um, the voters have kind of given up on, on quality control. They're not paying attention. They're not actually being a part of the system. They're not participating in the, the job of being a citizen. And that's one of the real problems we have today. So what I'm wondering is, and I know you don't work for ProPublica, but what I'm wondering is 
would it make sense for the uh, various levels of government, including the courts, including the legislature, including the city councils, to simply say that, well, we need a, a, an independent uh, prosecutor in the sense that we need an independent source of uh, evaluation of what we're doing, i.e. ProPublica, you know, getting a contract or, or, you know, positioning itself as a contractor to, uh, you know, on behalf of the public and behalf of the voters to examine what's actually going on and report that almost like Associated Press or something else as a, as a, as a, as a uh, news service that the newspapers can pick up or choose. Are not you saying to. should the should the government do that? Is well, that what your question is the, the, or the, support it. The, the, the voters could uh, well, and in, in in California right. we have the the uh, initiative process. You don't have that in New York. Yeah, now, I mean, I would say that in New York, um, politicians would rather encourage. You know, they'd rather poke out their eyes with red hot pokers than encourage more free press. But but that, but, but again, that's the point. So that, that there's a there's a process problem. It's not right. in the, the the result of of all the things you're talking about is the result of a bad process. And, yeah, I mean, I don't think the solution is inside the system. I mean, one of the things that I do want to say that's very very encouraging about this moment that I have not raised tonight and I have never seen anything like it is there are especially since the election, there's an army of citizen journalists who want to investigate things. And I have never had a situation where I've had in the last six months where people will look up records and they'll go look up land deals in New York and they'll send me real estate deeds and you know they'll send me real estate deeds from Columbia, South Carolina. I mean, I've never had a situation where I've, the citizenry seems more devoted to getting out information. And you know, one of the paradoxes of our time is that while what Paul is saying is absolutely true, I mean, you know, I found some records that I had uh, gotten under freedom of information request 10 years ago, and they were all paper printouts, and they were in a big box. And now all of those records, or many of them, would be online. And somebody, you know, some very smart 25-year-old adult brain <laughs> would, you know, search them and tell me what they found. And I could go back and verify it, but uh, it's true. So, I mean, I think that there is a lot of energy, and I think that, you know, the good thing is that um, there is a lot of motivated citizenry. The bad thing is, is that we have a president and a government that is telling people that we're dishonest. But, but it's, again, it's so, not the question of the presidency or the federal yeah. government. It's, it's, it's here in New York. Today, yeah. today the biggest story was this uh, the, the, the madman in, in Times Square. And, you know, the, the, the press has shown real uh, disinterest in actually reporting what actually happened. We don't know, was this fellow motivated by a terrorist impulse? We, we, it, it's simply. Well, I, I'm, sure, I'm sure that there's the, the dozens press, of reporters. Well, no, but the press printed on the, story the press right now. printed the De Blasio press release, which was this was a deranged, poor, uh, you know, fellow who uh, who decided to go out and hurt some people, you know. And it, it, but it, that but that's the, that, that that would be just. One, I mean, I'm, I imagine some news outlets included the press statement, um, but I read like seven. I'm I was homesick today. Um, and I woke up, and I live near Times Square, and I woke up to a bunch of text messages like, oh, my God, are you okay? And so I read, like, six or seven or eight different news articles on what happened. All taking okay. the you de Blasio know, line that this was a, a mentally no. deranged we need to. We're going to move on now, but thank you for that. I mean, I think it's an interesting suggestion, but I actually, my own belief is that the way to have more accountability is just to have a stronger independent press, uh, which needs you know, money. money and resources. Yes, over there, in the back. Yes, you, with the, with the glasses and the beard. <laughs> Not to condone what's currently going on with the attack on the media, but how do you see this different from historic other attacks on the media, like 1798 uh, Aliens and Sedition Acts, or during the Civil War when people doing uh, Confederate sentiments in the Union were jailed? So how is this different? Professor Moses, you want to take that question? I, I do write books on history, but I've never looked into that, so it's hard for me to say. Um, I mean, I think that the... The, the medium yeah. is different in, in different... It's different. You know, so it's more immediate, and, uh, and so that would definitely be a difference. Um, right. We don't have criminal Good prosecutions question. of journalists just yet, but uh, that would be 1798, right? So...
Yeah. You people hear what she said? There's strong, fr strong First Amendment law uh, and courts. First Amendment law made by the Supreme Court and other courts, state courts as well, have come a long way since the founding of our country as cases have come up. And, and think of the Pentagon Papers, you know, at a moment when Richard Nixon basically wanted to shut down um, reporting in the New York Times about a very significant issue, namely the origins uh, and 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 of the Vietnam War and the veracity of claims that were made along the way about that war. And uh, the Supreme Court, in a very important decision, says, no, we don't have prior restraint in the country. But that's just one of many. Some go the wrong way, but mostly, I mean, that I, I think that's one of the biggest differences today. All right, thank you, Dorothy Samuels. We have a question here in the back, and then we'll take one over there, and then I think we're um, going to have to finish up for the evening. So over here, this gentleman with the curly hair and the beard. <laughs> Given that Albany seems to be one of the larger crime scenes in the United States, why don't we have more local coverage of what's going on up there? I mean, I find the, the coverage of, of Albany politics really, really, except for Errol Lewis, What's going on? Paul, you I mean, does that? anybody cover it? I think part of it is that that's part of the contraction. What I, what I was saying with shrinkage is uh, state house bureaus all over the country. Uh, it's it's a well known phenomenon, which also affects how well you cover the presidential election if you don't also have any political reporters. It does, and, and I, I think truthfully, New York City based papers have never really put the interest in Albany that it deserves, even when they were well staffed. I'm also uh, yeah. going to say that the laws in New York are really bad. Our, you know, I've had personal terrible experiences. For example, I sent a freedom of information request to the governor, Governor Cuomo, and to the Port Authority for basically the same sets of documents regarding correspondence between the Port Authority and the governor. Port Authority, the Port Authority gave me the documents. The governor's office said these documents do not exist. Uh, and then another example is I assigned my class to go submit a freedom of information request to the legislature, and I learned that the legislatures exempted themselves from large portions of the freedom of information law. So, I mean, I think that there need, does need to be some public pressure on Albany because I think that, you know, those are sort of ways that they chip away at the ability to find things. They're terrific reporters in Albany, but when it becomes incredibly difficult to find basic information, uh, as you say, you have, we, I mean, I think it's pretty established. It's a huge crime scene. The way you leave Albany is by dying or being indicted. One other question. I think we had a question over on this side of the room. Yes, this gentleman here. That'll be our last question. Okay. So I, I thank you all for your, your work on local reporting here in New York, but I think us New Yorkers, if, if you didn't exist, we would protest so much that we, you would exist anyway. <laughs> but in the rest of the country, I don't have the same feeling. So whether we're talking about the disappearance of abortion clinics in Kentucky, or immigrant rights in Ohio, uh, beef processing plants, and so on. I'm not sure if there's, a, there's the same uh, feeling for the First Amendment out there. And maybe the reason we have the president we do is because local reporting out there is not as strong as it could be, even worse than it is here. I, I think so that how, is, how, how yeah. does that, how do we change that? I mean, I, I think that is question. a topic for another night. I mean, I'll end with a scary note and a hopeful note. The scary note is that I absolutely agree, and I think that in a lot of communities around the country, where they had, you know, Denver had three newspapers, and Seattle had two newspapers, and, uh, you know, a strong press in, in Iowa. I mean, there were, there were a lot of newspapers that connected people one to the other and created a sense of, uh, you know, people being in it together, and the outcomes of, would affect you. Those things have atrophied, and I do think that that is a vital connection that has died. I mean, I think the hopeful sign is that organizations like ProPublica, ProPublica is about to open a new, a whole new office in Chicago uh, and in Illinois to, to foster local journalism. So I think that, um, you know, sort of both things are happening at once. I think it's a crisis, but I also think that there are people alarmed about it and are starting to do things about it. So we're going to end there. Thank you so much to the panelists.